Hey everyone, you're watching Gamer Brain, and let's look at 13 video game lawsuits. Number 13 Grand Theft Lohan. In September of this year, a panel of judges agreed that Lindsay Lohan is pretty silly for suing Rockstar Games. According to her lawsuit, Rockstar Games used her likeness for one of the characters that appears in the title screen. Furthermore, Lindsay claims that a character's name, Lacey Jonas, is very similar to her own. Therefore, Rockstar owes her money and needs to pay up. Unsurprisingly, the judges did not see things her way. According to them, the character is completely a work of fiction. Even if it was based off of Lindsay Lohan, it is still legal because it classifies as satire. Then she left the room and they laughed and laughed. Now, I'd like to pause this countdown for a moment and ask a question to all of you. Do you think that Lohan was just trying to make some quick cash? Please leave a simple yes or no answer in the comments section. If you're feeling generous, please leave a like as it really helps out. Number 12. Beyonce – Star Power The former member of Destiny's Child almost had her own video game after she made a multi-million dollar agreement with the Manhattan game developers at Gate 5 LLC. When she suddenly changed her mind and backed out at the last minute, Gate 5 sued her for $100 million. Beyonce's sudden decision to leave reportedly put 70 people out of work and cost the video game company millions of dollars. According to the lawsuit, Beyonce wanted more money at the last second and then walked when her unfair demands weren't able to be met. Her video game was called Beyonce Star Power. Players would have danced in front of their television to her songs while she gave them a score as well as advice. Gate 5 and Beyonce have since settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. In the meantime, the gaming world will somehow have to go on without ever experiencing her amazing title. Number 11. Lumosity Hey, guess what? The game developers at Lumos Labs are a bunch of stupid lying jerks. These guys are the makers of the Lumosity brain training games that were supposedly designed to improve your thinking. Instead, the game makers were just looking to improve the size of their wallets. Fortunately, they just got nailed in court. Here's what happened. In January of this year, the Federal Trade Commercial slapped Lumos Labs with a huge lawsuit that gloriously detailed all of their BS claims, along with what was wrong with them. Most people have already seen the commercials. If not, all you need to know is that this is a company that ran commercials literally saying that their games were like a personal trainer for your brain. Here's a hint, they're not like personal trainers for your brain at all. The FTC particularly had a problem with Lumosity's claims that it could improve your performance at work or in school, that it could protect against age-related memory problems, and that it can reduce cognitive impairment for a laundry list of health conditions. When you say you have a product that can fight against everything from ADD to Alzheimer's, those are some pretty serious claims. Unfortunately for them, Lumos Labs had absolutely no evidence to support these outlandish theories. As they would soon come to find, putting these bogus claims on a label or in a commercial is a major violation of federal law. That's why Lumos Labs agreed to settle out of court on that very same day that the lawsuit was filed. The lawsuit originally fined Lumos Labs a total of $50 million. However, under an out-of-court agreement, Lumos Labs only has to pay $2 million back. They also have to let their 35 million users immediately cancel out without charging them any further. The only evidence Lumos Labs has to support their original claims is their customer testimonials, and even these are not authentic. Many of these customer testimonies came from people who were offered iPads, vacations, and lifetime subscriptions in exchange for their ringing endorsements. In a recent press release, Lumos Labs refused to admit that they got caught in a big fat lie. We proudly stand behind the Lumosity product, a representative was quoted as saying. Somehow, he even managed to keep a straight face the entire time. 
Number 10. Bungie Blows It The video game company Bungie might need to take some time off to compose themselves after losing a major lawsuit to Marty O'Donnell, the creator of legendary video game soundtracks for masterpieces such as Halo and Destiny. In 2014, Marty was fired by Bungie for what he feels was absolutely no good reason at all. Not only that, but the company also refused to pay him for unused vacation days, and they didn't make good on other benefits that were promised in his contract. All of his company shares in the stock market were unfairly taken from him too. First, the courts awarded Marty with just under $100,000 to cover his unused vacation days and attorney fees. But when they took a look at his missing shares, they felt he was entitled to a lot more. They gave him an additional $142,000 on top of that, bringing the total to just under a quarter of a million dollars. Obviously, this is chump change to Bungie, but it is still somewhat of a black eye to them. In the meantime, nobody really knows the true reason why Marty was fired. But since he has almost $250,000 from all of this, chances are he doesn't really care anymore. Number 9. Mortal Kombat in Real Life In 1997, a young boy named Yancey stabbed his 13-year-old friend, Noah Wilson, with a kitchen knife in the center of his chest. According to Noah's mother, Yancey was obsessed with Mortal Kombat, to the point where he believed he was the robotic character named Cyrax. According to the lawsuit, Noah's mother claims that the way Mortal Kombat was marketed and designed is what caused her son to die. When they made Mortal Kombat, the game developers at Midway were actually acting with negligence and intentionally meant to cause her emotional distress. At least, that's what the lawsuit said. In Midway's defense, the company pointed out that the steak knife was to blame for the child's injuries and not a physical copy of Mortal Kombat. In other words, unless Noah's mother found a Mortal Kombat CD sticking out of her son's chest, then there was absolutely no way to prove a connection between the two. And even if there was a connection, the First Amendment gives Midway the right to make a game about whatever they darn well pleased. The lawsuit itself looked ridiculous in 1997, and it looks even more ridiculous now. The plaintiff's lawyer argues that video games have come a long way since Pong, and now the technology has become so advanced that it can reprogram a young person's mind and teach them how to kill. The lawsuit even claims that a finishing move is teaching violence as a quote, viable problem-solving technique. Basically, it argues that Mortal Kombat was so much fun to kids that it made killing seem like a good idea. Fortunately, the judge was level-headed enough to realize how pointless this lawsuit was. He threw it out without so much as a second thought. In the official verdict, the judge points out that Mortal Kombat is not much different than if the words of a Shakespearean play inspired someone to kill. While he does have a good point, this is probably the first, last and only time that the Mortal Kombat series would ever be compared to Shakespeare. Number 8. The Wrath of the Olsen Twins The makers of Turok faced their biggest opponent yet in 2004 when they were sued by Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. Apparently, after the video game company was audited by the IRS, a claim was found to owe hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Olsen Twins for numerous video games. Not only were the Olsen twins owed money for previous video games, but they were also losing money after a claim suddenly cancelled a game called Mary-Kate and Ashley in Action. This title was supposed to be released for the GameCube, the Game Boy Advance, PlayStation 2 and the computer in 2003. A judge awarded the Olsen twins $178,000 in royalties along with additional interest. The cancellation of their video game also netted them an additional 300000 which is probably more money than any crappy Olsen Twin video game has actually ever made before. Number 7. Grand Theft Auto in Real Life In 2003, 17-year-old Devin Moore stole a car. When he was caught and taken into the police station, 
he revealed a chilling outlook on life. Life is a video game, he told the police. You've got to die sometime. Immediately after these words, Devin grabbed an officer's handgun and shot him in the head along with two other officers. He then drove off in a police car and was captured soon afterwards. Later, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Two years after this happened, a state attorney named Jack Thompson files a civil lawsuit against Sony Corporation. He says that this lawsuit is on behalf of the three police officers' families. In an email, Jack writes that selling the Grand Theft Auto video game is no different than the Pearl Attack Harbor during World War II. It was also no different than the distribution of pornography in his mind. Eventually, the Alabama Supreme Court dismissed the lawsuit, citing the First Amendment rights to both Sony and Rockstar. Just as with the Mortal Kombat lawsuit, Rockstar is free to make a game about whatever they want, and Sony is allowed to publish it. As for Jack Thompson, he caused such an uproar in court that a judge took away his license to practice law. Number 6. Let's just rip Nintendo off. That's what the game makers at Tengen were thinking when they decided to make their own games for Nintendo, without Nintendo's permission. It was the late 1980s and Nintendo was on top of the video game industry. As such, they had some serious rules to cut out the competition. If you wanted to make a game for Nintendo, for example, then you had to promise to only make games for Nintendo for at least two years. You were also only allowed to release five new games per year. Tengen didn't like these regulations, so they decided to take matters into their own hands. Tengen is a subdivision of Atari. What Atari did was basically create fake court documents that looked like they were suing Nintendo. They sent these fake documents to the United States Copyright Office and managed to get designs on a special lockout chip that Nintendo had made. This chip was designed so that only certain cartridges would play on the Nintendo system. At the time, Tengen was only officially allowed to make Gauntlet, Pac-Man and RBI Baseball for the Nintendo system. Instead of getting Nintendo's blessing to make more games, Tengen and Atari decided to reverse engineer the chip and start making their very own video games for the Nintendo system. While Tengen was busy distributing illegal Nintendo games, Atari was suing Nintendo for $100 million. By denying them the right to make video games on the Nintendo system, Atari said that Nintendo was engaging in unfair competition practices. Not only was Atari making unlicensed games, but they were also suing Nintendo for the right to do so. Nintendo countersued Tengen for fraudulent practices, for selling unlicensed games, and for reverse engineering their lockout chip. Atari was also named for their role in creating false documents as well. This lawsuit represented the future of the video games industry. On one hand, Nintendo was claiming that it had full control over what it could publish on its system. On the other hand, this business practice seemed to fly in the face of free market competition. The lawsuit was eventually settled out of court. After a federal investigation, Nintendo agreed to ease up on its licensing restrictions. Eventually, Tengen went too far when they started to make their own version of Tetris for Nintendo, but that's a different story. Number 5. The Romantics Are Big Jerks The Romantics wrote the hit rock song What I Like About You, and they are also big jerks who like to sue people for no good reason. Just ask Activision, the makers of Guitar Hero. Okay, here's what happened. First, Activision gets the Romantics' permission to use their hit song for Guitar Hero Encore, Rocks the 80s. The Romantics say that Activision isn't allowed to use the original song, but they are allowed to make a cover of the song. Sounds good, right? So, that's exactly what Activision does. Then the Romantics sues them. Why, you ask? because the cover song was too good. That's right, the cover song was so dead on that the Romantics accused Activision of infringing on the group's right to its own image. So, to recap, Activision gets the Romantics' permission to make a cover, Activision follows through, 
and the romantic sue them for the most ridiculous reason in video game history. Eventually, a Detroit federal judge agreed that Activision should be allowed to use the song that they were originally given permission to use. Seriously, the romantics, what the heck were you thinking? This lawsuit is definitely not what I like about you. Number 4. No Doubt Are Big Jerks Too The band No Doubt also sued Activision in 2009 for letting their digital avatars play other artists' songs in a Guitar Hero game. Just to be clear, No Doubt had no problem with lending their digital likeness to the game, but they only wanted to be seen playing their own songs. Geez, No Doubt, who really cares? Activision countersued, claiming that No Doubt did not promote the game enough and failed to live up to other contractual agreements. In the end, the two parties agreed to settle out of court for an undisclosed amount. Don't speak, I know what you're saying. This is a really dumb lawsuit, and I agree. Number 3. The People vs Donkey Kong In the early 1980s, Universal Studios got really upset with Nintendo over Donkey Kong. It was obvious that the Donkey Kong character was influenced by the movie King Kong, and since Universal Studios owned the rights to King Kong, they felt like they were owed money on the Nintendo game's sales. When Universal Studios found out that Nintendo was trying to sell its game to Coleco, they flipped their lid and threatened to sue Coleco for copyright infringement. By this point, however, Donkey Kong was already scheduled to launch with the Coleco Vision. The copies were already manufactured and had been bundled with the system, and the decision could not be reversed. As a compromise, Universal promised not to sue Coleco as long as they were paid royalties on every single cartridge that they sold. Coleco agreed. Thus, Universal Studios had effectively bullied its way in to the games industry. With this first obstacle out of the way, Universal Studios' next move was to intimidate Nintendo itself. Nintendo was a rather small company at the time, and Universal Studios was huge. They not only contacted Nintendo, but they also got in touch with every other company that was affiliated with the Donkey Kong franchise, including Mattel, whose only crime was making a Donkey Kong board game. They even legally threatened the makers of a Donkey Kong cereal. The result? Well, Nintendo told Universal to go suck eggs. They basically said, listen, there's plenty of instances of other companies using King Kong without a license, so stop your crying. When Universal claimed that they had the paperwork to show that they owned the title to King Kong, they never sent it. Nintendo had called their bluff. On June 29, 1982, Universal Studios made an even bigger bluff and sued Nintendo for copyright infringement. Nintendo's lawyers did some digging of their own and were able to find an embarrassing lawsuit from Universal's past. You see, at one point in the 1970s, Universal Studios had wanted to make a remake of King Kong themselves. This was when they proved in court that King Kong was actually public domain, meaning that it belonged to nobody. Now they were foolish enough to try to argue the exact opposite was true. When they brought this decision to the judge's attention, not only did the judge see things Nintendo's way, but he also awarded Nintendo almost $2 million in restitution. Universal Studios appealed the case all the way to the US Supreme Court, but the case failed at every level, and nothing came of it. In a way, Universal Studios is responsible for giving Nintendo a huge boost in the video games industry. Not only were they nearly $2 million richer, but they also now had a reputation as a scrappy little video game company who were not afraid of a tough fight. And to think, all of this legal mumbo-jumbo was over an 8-bit monkey who just wanted to throw some barrels. Number 2. Nintendo vs Blockbuster Nintendo successfully got video game rentals banned in Japan in the 1980s, and they're still banned in Japan to this day. Nintendo tried to do the same thing in America, but it didn't turn out so well. 
When Blockbuster started renting out games, Nintendo flipped out worse than Universal Studios did over Donkey Kong. They simply couldn't let people rent cartridges from a store instead of buying a copy for themselves. Nintendo was going to lose a fortune from this. First, Nintendo joined with other companies such as Microsoft to push for the Computer Software Rental Amendments Act to pass. Basically, they wanted Nintendo games to be protected from rentals just like other forms of software. This never happened. In fact, the bill passed with a special exclusion for video games instead. Next, Nintendo tried to push the Computer Software Protection Act, which only allowed retail stores to rent video games out one year after their release. When this didn't work, they decided to sue Blockbuster. The problem was there was simply nothing wrong with renting out games. It was completely legal to rent out a video game, so Nintendo had to get creative. In 1989, Nintendo sued Blockbuster over instruction manuals. Sometimes Blockbuster would photocopy the manuals, and Nintendo said that this was copyright infringement. This case was eventually settled out of court, but it was definitely an attempt on Nintendo's behalf to stall the video game rental industry. Even though Blockbuster was able to fight the lawsuit, it sent a clear message to smaller rental chains that they were in danger too. Number 1. James Burt Screws Up Big In 2009, a 24-year-old man from Australia was somehow able to obtain a copy of the new Super Mario Bros for the Wii a full week before its release. Sounds great, right? Well, what he did next was just really stupid. James decided to share his discovery with everyone on the internet by uploading a full version of the game for free. As you could imagine, Nintendo was not very happy when they learned that a full version of their game had been downloaded more than 50,000 times in less than 5 days. They got the police on the case and were able to quickly hunt him down. James Burt decided to settle out of court, but the negotiations were not cheap. In the end, he agreed to pay Nintendo a grand total of one and a half million dollars to make up for their losses. In addition, he needed to cough up an extra hundred thousand dollars more to cover their legal bill. Congratulations James, we sure hope that playing Mario a week in advance was worth losing well over a million dollars. Bonus, stuff that should have gotten games companies sued, but somehow didn't. A long time ago, the video game industry was a lot more relaxed, and this story proves it. Case in point, Tiger Woods PGA Tour for the PlayStation 1. If you put this game into the computer, you were able to watch an early episode of South Park where Jesus gets in a boxing match with Satan. Somebody at EA Sports had decided it would be funny to slip the full episode onto every disc. Somehow this only resulted in a massive recall and no lawsuits. Think about if this happened today. Do you think Trey Parker and Matt Stone would have sued EA Sports? Thanks for checking out this video. Since you watched the whole thing, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button. Subscribe as well if you want, since we upload a new gaming countdown each week. See ya.